Uh, my name is uh, Anirban. I'm a pediatric oncologist and cancer geneticist working with the International Replication Repair Deficiency Consortium. And it's my privilege today to share with you some of the work that we have been doing, Uri, Eric, Vanessa, and the team. And I will be mainly focusing on how immunotherapy is really making a difference in treating children with constitutional mismatch repair deficiency or CMMRD. And hope we have some time for questions in the end as well. So to start off things, each cell needs to divide as we all grow up. We all start from a single cell. And the cell, as you know, has DNA, which is the genetic material that codes for everything that goes on in our body. However, the DNA replication of the two strands that exist, which have to become four strands and then be rearranged in a proper manner, is an error-prone process. However, we are fortunate that it has been built in as a safe mechanism that the errors don't actually go out of hand. For this, we have a set of four mismatch repair genes seen here, which I will abbreviate as MMR and deficiencies D. So MMRD is mismatch repair deficiency. And we have a set of two polymerase proofreading genes, which not only help the DNA to sort of replicate, but also have a proofreading function in the end to make sure that there are no errors. And this I will be abbreviating as polymerase proofreading deficiency. So when there is a genetic loss, or an acquired loss in the cancer of either of these pathways, you can imagine that because these fail-safe mechanisms that prevent errors from happening gets lost, this can lead to a huge number of mutations in these sort of cancers. And the mutations can be of two types. There are actually four alphabets that make the chain of DNA, A, C, G, and T. And sometimes the C, which was supposed to be here, has changed to A. This is something that we know as a single nucleotide change which is actually measured in terms of tumor mutation burden or TMB. But there can also be large chunks of insertions and deletions of these abnormal alphabets in some repeated segments of the genomes known as microsatellite, which gives rise to microsatellite instability, which I will be abbreviating as MSI. So the bottom line is that because of a genetic defect, or sometimes that may be acquired as a result of other mechanisms, there is a problem in the error detection while the DNA gets replicated, and this leads to high number of mutations as well as microsatellite instability. Moving ahead, in CMMRD in particular, which as you know is a genetic defect which we are born with, every cell in the body is at risk because each cell at the body is having a problem with the mismatch repair and polymerase proofreading deficiency. So each cell of the body can actually develop into a cancerous cell. And that's why in this publication last year, or actually early this year, we found that children with CMRD can develop cancers anywhere in the body. But as probably we see that most common are the brain tumors, in particular, high-grade glioblastomas. But there are also other cancers that can virtually arise anywhere in the body because of the underlying genetic defect. Moving on. Uh, because of the high rate of mutation accumulation, these cancers are actually very, very aggressive as compared to cancers in other individuals. Because as you can see in our work from 2015, this is a scale that shows the mutation burden and this is in the logarithmic scale. So all our cancers in children with CMRD are here because they have both MMRD and PPD. And their mutation burden is extremely, extremely high as compared to other pediatric cancers and even other cancers in adults like in adults, there are other mechanisms of having high mutation burden, like by smoking or by ultraviolet lay exposure. But even in comparison to these cancers, which are over here, our cancers have really, really high mutation burden, which makes them actually more aggressive. However, as you may imagine, cancer cells are not normal. They are mutated, as we discussed in the last few slides. So ideally, whenever there is an abnormal cell in the body, like a virus or a bacteria or any other external insult that comes in, the body should have its own immune mechanism, respond to that and take care of those abnormal particles or cells. So in an ideal world, the cancer cells should also be sort of eliminated by the immune system that is there in our body because these cells are not normal, they're mutated. So the immune cells, particularly the T cells, which are very strong killers in the body, should actually ideally identify these cancer cells and kill them off. However, the cancer cells are actually pretty clever because they can bind to the T cell. You can see the tumor cell over here and this T cell, which is supposed to kill it. But the T cell can't kill it because the cancer cell expresses this molecule known as PDL1, which binds to a 
molecule known as PD-1 in the T cell. And this interaction sort of prevents the T cell from killing the tumor cell, though it sort of recognizes that it's not a normal cell. Fortunately, over the last two decades, if I may say, we have discovered drug, drugs that can actually modify or prevent this interaction from happening. And you can imagine that if it is this interaction that prevents the T cell from killing of the cancer cells, if you can block this by using drugs, which we will call as anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1, the tumor cell is now free to recognize and kill of the cancer cell. So this was a big discovery where you are actually using the body's own immune T cells to kill off cancer cells. And no wonder that won the Nobel Prize in 2018, because this was a landmark therapy for cancers, which was previously treated by only surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, which actually was not that effective for the cancers that we are talking about today. Uh, so, as you know that Uri and Eric, Dr. Tabori and Dr. Buffet established this international consortium of over 170 physicians and 30 scientists from more than 45 countries. And with the discovery and learning about CMRD progressing, as well as the immunotherapy progressing on the other side, it was a very opportunate moment in the last five years to actually bring people together and try to do things together as a part of our international consortium, which you can see from the map over here. So we were working not only on the surveillance protocols and the diagnostics like you heard last time and Brian will speak of in the next talk. We also wanted to do things that actually takes the field forward and allows us to cure more patients. So immunotherapy made sense because T cells require antigens to recognize abnormal cells. And because of the high mutation burden in the cancers that we deal with, the new antigen or the new antigens were actually more in numbers, which sort of make logical sense that immunotherapy should be working for these cancers. So we started treating patients with immunotherapy who failed chemotherapy and radiation. And today I will be talking about the first 45 cancers that were treated in the first 38 patients in the last five years. Relatively young age, as you may imagine, because most of our patients are children. Majority of them had CMRD, but there were also conditions known as Lynch syndrome and PPD, which can also develop similar kinds of cancers. The drug we used was anti-PD-1, uh, two brands were used, nivolumab or pembrolizumab, depending on availability. And most importantly, Dr. Buffet and Dr. Tabori were, used, were able to use their uh, advocacy to actually get compassionate access with the patient advocates from all over the world, because these are pretty expensive drugs. So we could actually reach out to the drug companies and make sure that even patients in developing countries could get access to some of these medicines. These were all a majority of cancers which had failed sort of normal treatment, and some of them had spread out to the other parts of the body. And we did uh, several uh, biological tests to understand more about these tumors while we were treating them. Uh, so we treated a lot of tumors. As you can see, the major chunk was brain tumors, which are more common in these patients. And probably for the first time ever, which we didn't see with chemotherapy or radiation, this white tumor chunk over here has actually shrunk with the immunotherapy. And you can see it has almost disappeared. And this is something that we call as a waterfall plot, which measures the tumor change in two dimensions. And from the negatives over here, minus 20 to minus 100, you can see that several of these tumors did actually respond and shrink in size, including some tumors which had almost the tumor completely gone because there was 100% response. So this was remarkable and never seen in the era of chemotherapy and radiation therapy in CMMR-related cancers. Moving ahead, this is something that we call as a survival curve. This is years, and these are the percentage of patients surviving. And as I was telling you that chemotherapy and radiotherapy was being used, but, but not that much effective. But here we can see that with immunotherapy, patients are surviving for like more than four years over here. And at the end of three years, around 40% of patients are surviving using immunotherapy, which never happened in the era of chemotherapy and radiation. So we are curing almost or having long-term survival for almost half of the patients, not all. And we found that the brain tumors responded a bit less as compared to the non-brain tumors. And uh, this was still remarkable for brain tumors, like probably, you know, glioblastoma, even in an otherwise context is usually fatal, but 40% of children surviving at around three years is pretty remarkable that we got as responses using immunotherapy in cancers who had failed other forms of treatment. Uh, so we did some biological studies and found that uh, tumors which had high TMB and high MSI. If you remember in the first slide, I talked about high TMB and high MSI. Not all cancers have really high TMB or really high MSI, but the cancers which did have those, the green lines over here, 
had almost 75 to 80 percent of the patients surviving as compared to cancers within this cohort of patients who had relatively lower TMB or lower MSI. How does this happen? These brown dots are the T cells, which are supposed to kill off the cancer cells. And in a normal brain tumor like glioblastoma, you will never see something like this. It's usually something like this. But here you can see that in CMRD, there are T cells which are sort of infiltrating into the cancer cells. And once you activate the T cells by using the proper medicine, they are sort of free to kill off the tumor cells. And this is what we saw in many of our patients. In fact, the tumors which had both high TMB, high MSI, and had high T cell infiltration did exceedingly well, almost 80% of them surviving as compared to tumors which lacked these biomarkers, what we call as the genomic and immune biomarkers. So we really had a group of tumors who did exceedingly well immunotherapy. So not all patients respond. And even within this patient category, there are divisions of patients who respond really well and patients who do not respond that good. We also learned while treating patients that sometimes uh, the patients can respond after what seems like progression, which never happens usually with chemotherapy, sometimes happens with radiation. And we can see uh, this was a patient from India whom I treated back home when I was there. So the tumor, because it was so immune infiltrated with T cells, actually had an immune reaction which after persisting with therapy went away with time. Another patient here on, in sick kids, where we thought that the disease was not responding that much, and we sort of were pretty sort of sad about that. But when we saw the patient after six months, we saw that the tumor had disappeared. So we learned that immunotherapy is not like chemotherapy or radiation, where you give the treatment, and the treatment, if it, if it has to happen, has to happen pretty fast. Here we can see that once the immune system is activated, you can actually get pretty delayed responses. So we learned together with the physicians treating these patients around the world that we should not give up easily, especially if there are biomarkers which help us think before that, okay, this is a tumor, this is likely to respond. So if it is not responding, there must be something wrong over there. Moving ahead, this also allowed us to treat some cancers which were previously thought to be incurable. Uh, this is a cancer known as medulloblastoma, and once these cancers recur, recur or come back, there is practically no treatment that you can offer. But if this cancer happens in the backdrop of CMMRD, because they are so hypermutant, they can respond to immunotherapy, and you can again see patients surviving and responding radiologically. Similarly, as I told you in one of my previous slides, that in CMRD, patients can develop two or three cancers sometimes at the same time. This was such a patient who had a colon carcinoma or colon cancer spreading to the bone as well as a brain tumor. But because all these tumors in the different parts of the body are driven by the same genetic mechanism and have the same high TMB, high MSI, they can respond in a tissue agnostic manner to immunotherapy. So when we have cancers in different parts of the body, we have drugs that are sort of selective for those specific cancers. But here we can see that it's a pan-cancer drug because you are actually activating the immune system to kill off the cancer cell rather than targeting the cancer cells per se. So we were lucky to share some of this data with our physician colleagues from around the world in the Pediatric Oncology Conference uh, this year. And this work has also been accepted in Nature Medicine, which is a good medical journal, which we hope people will read and learn more about these tumors. But as you saw, we can't cure all children. So we actually had to take some steps forward, which I will be sharing with you today. So if you remember, there was a subset of patients who did remarkably well with the high genetic genomic markers and immune biomarkers. And as you know that previously we were treating these children with radiation and chemotherapy, which have their own side effects. And people were not actually doing well with that sort of treatment. So now we can actually identify a group of children with brain cancers, including glioblastoma, who can actually respond directly to immunotherapy. And we can spare them the side effects of being treated with radiation or chemotherapy. This is a very small subgroup, mind you, and we have to be very careful but we treated a couple of patients like this, did surgery alone, good resection, and then treated with immunotherapy alone with some successes, two patients surviving for more than two years now. And now we are trying to develop a clinical trial uh, with more number of patients, including patients from the developing world, to make sure that children who do not need toxic radiation, toxic chemotherapy can be spared from some of these treatments. Similarly, we can actually, actually cure only 40% of children, so we need to do more to treat or cure more children. So it made sense that we can combine different immunotherapy drugs because maybe two is better than one. So Dr. Daniel Morgenstern from SickKids is leading this clinical trial of combined immunotherapy in several centers across North America, as you can see. 
and we feel that with use of two inhibitors we can probably treat and cure more children not only that uh, our lab actually i want to share how they use the tissue that we get to understand more and open up new dimensions of treatment while examining many of the cancer tissues that were sent to us from different parts of the world by physicians and you we found that though these tumors are hypermutant they have addiction to a particular type of mutation known as map kinase pathway mutations so we tried to develop mice models of similar kinds of cancers and when we treated these mice with these map kinase mutations with a drug which actually exactly treats that mutation uh, the drug names are here trametinib and selimatinib again two companies two different drugs but basically they work in the same way we found that the tumors which had got this drug had a slower growth rate as compared to tumors which did not get the drug and you can actually see the mice tumors decreasing in size with the use of trametinib and selimatinib so we learned by analyzing the tumor tissues that despite being hypermutant there are certain mutations which these cancers seem to be addicted to and we can actually have drugs that can be used to treat these sort of cancers and that's exactly what we did next because immunotherapy won't actually cure everybody this child was not responding to single agent nivolumab the anti pd1 immunotherapy but when we combine this with the targeted therapy trametinib you can see that the tumor has disappeared over the course of one and a half years so again we are working with a big consortium collaborative in north america to develop a clinical trial for patients who have not responded to the single agent immunotherapy and use combination of targeted and immunotherapy for these patients to have more robust responses so as you can imagine neither or none of this work would have been possible without you and the physicians that we work with from across the globe and some of their names are over here so collaborators both nationally in canada in the states and across the world including pakistan india and other parts of the middle east our amazing lab where actually people do this kind of work and i am very fortunate as a clinician to sort of interact them on a daily basis and learn from them and as vanessa mentioned if we have time for questions we can answer some of them now but feel free to reach to either vanessa directly through our email or through our website if we do not manage to answer all of your questions today and thank you again for sharing your stories with us we are really fortunate to do what we do with your help from around the world thank you so much for your time and listening